Dartmoor is without doubt the last great wilderness of southern England. It can look gentle, picturesque even, at sunrise on a summer's day. But it's still wild at heart. Of all the creatures that call the moor home, the Dartmoor pony is the best known. Exactly when the ponies began to live and breed on Dartmoor is a question that no one can answer with any degree of precision. Left to graze and breed on the moor, the animals evolved into exceptionally tough and hardy ponies, domesticated but with an independence of spirit born out of their constant struggle against the elements. Feed is the short tufty type of grass rather than the lush meadows of the lowlands, filled out with heather and gorse. For shelter the ponies use the massive boulders and stone walls of the high moor. I think the first thing that comes to mind with the Dartmoor pony is the wonderful temperament and its adaptability. Um, it, it makes the most perfect ride for a young child, but you put an older child or an adult on it, and it immediately sort of gingers up and, and gives them a good ride, and could even be, you know, quite, quite strong, but it'll immediately, when you put a small child on it, it's quite extraordinary how they adapt to their, their rider. And um, they are the most beautiful ponies. I mean, the, the best of them have the, the conformation and the quality, you could say, almost of a middleweight hunter. But they still retain the wonderful pony character and robustness. And I think it's this that, that makes them, well, for me anyway, the absolute top the pony world, the native pony world. I think the, the breed show it is a shop window for breeders to display their wares, and it's the most marvellous forum, of course, for people to come from all over the country and from abroad to see the cream of the breed. Now, I've got the message, those lucky enough to win a cup. Exhibitors who win cups they will be asked to contribute four, four, four pounds per cup with towards engraving costs. And the engraving will be done by the Dartmoor Pony Society. Now, I'm going to give you an unofficial result, ladies and gentlemen, in the Italian class. I haven't received the official judge's sheet, but it looks to me from here, and in fact, I've got confirmation this is coming to me, and so it's 103 is the winner, and Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Roberts is his salvo. Few shows are without a class of Dartmoor ponies and the annual breed show at Bicton in South Devon has grown into a very special day out for everyone connected with the Dartmoors. This is among the highlights of the year. Breeders come from all over Britain and from nearby European countries in pursuit of those elusive prizes and the esteem of their fellow Dartmoor enthusiasts. None of this would happen without the Dartmoor Pony Society. The Dartmoor Pony Society was founded in 1924, but in fact the, the National Pony Society, which was then called the Polar Pony Society, had opened a section in their stud book in 1895, I think. And... Um, it wasn't until 1924 that the Dartmoor Pony Society was founded, and this didn't last very long because they were soon in financial difficulties because the ponies really had awfully little value at that time, and there was 
virtually no interest outside the West Country. So in 1932, they had to close the society, or at least they, they, they went bankrupt, and they, they had insufficient money even to pay their secretary. And it was then that um, Sylvia Calmady Hamlin took it on, debts and all, and um, continued to act as secretary and pay for everything, including the show, for 30 years. Another very touching thing which I learnt from her trustees after she had died, that she had, in fact, um, a row of cottages near her which were all tenanted. The owner had wanted to sell and was going to evict these tenants who had been there throughout their lives. And she bought cottages for what was really a very large sum in those days. And she gave each cottage to their tenant. But the marvelous thing was that she did it anonymously. And I think this typifies her, absolutely. I think her great love was the Dartmoor pony. In fact, she had, she had um, before the war, um, a number of breeds. Polar ponies, Shetland ponies, Welsh, as well as her Dartmoors. And at the outbreak of war, she had 110 ponies, actually, and she was given a week or a fortnight or something to dispose of all but 10. And, and many of them had to be shot. But she felt that the most important was to keep the Dartmoors, the nucleus of the Dartmoors. So all the rest went, and they were absolute top ponies of their breeds. And she kept the ten Dartmoors. And from those, actually, all the top present-day show ponies are descended. You could say virtually every pony entered in a show descended from those. Silver Calmady Hamlin, um, on behalf of the Dartmoor Pony Society, presented um, a pony that she had bred. And she presented it to the Queen for Prince Charles getting in pretty smartly before the Welsh <laughs> offered to do the same. And um, th this pony, in fact, was an enormous success and, and went to um, Sybil Smith, who, in fact, taught all the royal family to ride, and told me years later, when the pony was nearly 30 years old, that it was quite the best pony she'd ever had for teaching young children. The careful tending of bloodlines by breeders like the late Sylvia Calmady Hamlin is one thing, but out on the moor, the quality of the wild ponies was declining. Something had to be done. These mares being rounded up at the new takes or enclosed land near Huckabee are part of an exciting new project called the Dartmoor Pony Moorland Scheme. With encouragement and funding from Prince Charles via the Duchy of Cornwall and the Dartmoor National Park, the heart of the scheme is to put animals straight off the moor with pedigree stallions in the expectation of improved progeny. Initially, there were just 17 mares from seven owners, with a single stallion supplied by a duchy tenant. That was back in 1988, but since then, Moreland's scheme has grown and grown, with the mares being put forward, outrunning the land available in the new takes. The support of local people to take part in the traditional drift of the ponies is vital and a traditional part of the autumn landscape on the moor.
Public interest in the scheme has risen markedly as the years have gone by, with the Park Authority offering guided walks around the scheme to those who are interested, out of the 8 to 9 million visitors who come to Dartmoor each year. Beautiful Dartmoor may be, but the ponies have to compete with other farming uses of the land, and in recent years have been losing out to animals that produce better economic returns. Forty years ago, there were estimated to be around 30,000 ponies on Dartmoor, but that number has now dropped to around 3,000. The ponies are beginning to be appreciated as quite as vital to the landscape as the streams, hills or woodland that crisscross the moorland. As the use of the park as a recreational space for city dwellers increases, even a village like Whittacombe in the Moor, often thought of as overrun with tourists, can be accepted for what it can offer in a mixed and imperfect environment. It's a long way from the glitter of the annual breed show at Bicton, but where could be more important to show a Dartmoor than at Widdicombe, in the very heart of the moor? Numbers may be a bit smaller, but the level of competition is every bit as keen. Rosettes come out and will be treasured just as much as a supreme championship at a national show and plenty of people here have won both. Just as much a part of Dartmoor tradition as Widdicombe Fair is the pony sale each autumn at Sherberton Farm in a secret valley hidden away on the southern fringe of the moor. There's no fancy auctioneer's ring here, just a circle of straw bales and eager punters in the yard. Diana Coker and her family have been putting their own and neighbours' ponies under the hammer here for more years than most people can remember. It's not widely advertised, Word of mouth around the Devon horsey world is a more effective means of communication, but there's always a good crowd and a strong catalogue. It's a sort of become a tradition that we have this sale every year. Um, today hasn't possibly been as good as it has been, not for the riding ponies anyway. You never quite understand the British public what they like. There have been Dartmoor ponies here for six generations. This is a Duchy of Cornwall farm, and my youngest son is now farming it, and he is the sixth generation to farm it. Many years ago, the Dartmoor ponies were a lot bigger than they are now. 
and it's always our ambition to try and get them to be a bit bigger. Up till the end of the 50s, there was a good demand for pit ponies, of which they ran the Shetland ponies on the Dartmoors to try and get them a smaller size, round about 11, 11 true. And there was a very good trade for pit ponies. There were only geldings, not mares in those days. And, but now that's gone, so there's an awful lot of rather nondescript ponies left on the moor that um, some have a little job to find a home. And I'll put it now and you can say that there is no killing trade for Dartmoor foals. As the French nor the Belgians will not eat Dartmoor pony meat. No, there's no meat on the foal, there's nothing. They like a horse about 20 years old. I have a horse here, a Normandy cob. And I describe it, you can ride it, drive it, and eat it. Not restricted to Dartmoors alone, they are the focus of everyone's interest. Sherberton is regarded as a particularly good opportunity to buy a mare and foal together. Although, like any auction, the prices are entirely in the lap of the gods, depending on the mood of the crowd and what's gone through the ring already. We've got about 40 Dartmoor mares that we breed from and they all run on the Newtics. That's why the foals are never as big and never sort of as well fed as what you see. There was a lady sold a pony here today for nearly 300 and she bought it here as a foal two years ago and probably gave about 60 for it, maybe 50. Yes, if you can give your ponies a holiday when they're foals to a yearling, so they will grow well up to size, but living a hard life out here, um, they don't grow quite as big. I think nature says you've got to stay smaller so you can shelter under the walls. Sherberton is renowned for its autumn sunlight, but winter is just around the corner. Snow comes early to Dartmoor because of its altitude, up to a thousand feet above sea level. Like the other animals, the ponies must forage as best they can, looking for food in the little patches and crevices where the snow hasn't settled. Deep drifts can last for weeks, if not months, and only the fittest will survive. One of the guiding principles of the moorland pony scheme has been to improve the bloodline so that the foals and young stock it produces will be hardier and more able to withstand the hardships of winter. However cold the weather, everyone knows that spring will come at last, new life bursting out all over Dartmoor. For the breeder, it's the most exciting time of the year, a foal due any day. An hour after its birth, this foal at a farm on the Devon Somerset border is enjoying the spring sunshine.
Shilston Rock Stud has been a jewel in the Dartmoor Stud Book for as long as most people can remember. Owner Elizabeth Newbolt Young has produced animals that have won virtually every trophy on offer. Her idyllic farm with its 13th century house and wonderful flower-filled meadows is everyone's idea of the perfect West Country life. Her ponies thrive and have been exported all over the world, given a marvellous start in life. Elizabeth herself is as Dartmoor to the core as the pony she devotes herself to. Yes, as a child we lived very free and wild. We used to, our main enjoyment in life I think was walking and strolling around the ponies on the moor. And certainly, um, you know, they were, they were my playmates, the ponies, the wild ponies on the moor. I knew nearly all of them by name, or I, names I gave them. <laughs> and um, occasionally we, I used to bring them into my mother's garden much to her horror, and in one case, in fact, I even drove one into a shed and got on its back because I was desperately keen to have a pony and I didn't have one in those days. And the ponies on the moor were my life. But I didn't go to school very much, I'm afraid. <laughs> the reason I've been very keen on my children's education is because um, I did regret it. I do regret it now. <laughs> but during those days, we always had to either walk or ride to school, which was in Chagford, and that was about five miles away. So five miles there and five miles back every day was quite a long slog. But sometimes we used to drive the pony, my, my child pony, my little fell Dartmoor cross to school. And sometimes I used to ride it. And occasionally if I couldn't find the pony, because it used to live on the moor, and in fact we had no land of our own. So when I wanted the pony, I had to whistle for it. And I used to go out onto the, onto the common and, and whistle for this pony. And she used to come flying down to me from the, from the herd. And I used to sort of saddle and bride her up and go to school. <laughs> I used to go over and help somebody called Molly Croft at the Jerston stud. I used to help her with her pedigree ponies a lot. And I used to help her break them in and handle them. And in fact, the first pony we ever bought, bought was a, a foal from her stud. And um, it was called Jerston Juliana. I think it was in the year that Queen Juliana was crowned. And so that was my first ever pedigree Dartmoor pony. Um, but. Actually, we never took delivery of that because I also had a dog and I had this other pony my mother had given me and she said, look, you know, we can't cope with all this. We just can't do it. <laughs> I think the price we paid for that foal was five pounds, five pounds cash. But in fact, um, Molly Croft very kindly took it back again, sold it to somebody else because <laughs> my mother thought it was all a bit too much. Our first stallion actually came from over in Oakhampton way and it was called Silver Dollar and it was... Um, bred by the Cocos, and uh, it was a very wild stallion. It had a very long mane. It was renowned for its long mane. It reached down to the floor, mm -hmm. and he was, a, he was a great chap. And then we progressed and gradually got other stallions, and then we started breeding our own. So now we have about five, around five or six, I think. <laughs> Too many, probably. <laughs> I'm not a scientific person, but obviously one does remember what grandparents and great-grandparents looked like if one's lucky enough to know what they were like and you know what their faults are so you you're pretty careful not to um, put two animals with the same fault together you know you always try and uh, if you've got a lovely long front and a, and a bad hind leg you obviously don't put that stallion if the mare and the stallion have got a bad hind leg you don't put them together because obviously you're going to accentuate in most cases you're going to accentuate a bad fault and likewise, if you've, if you've got a, an attractive plain neck, you'd be careful to put a mare to a stallion with a really good front and long neck and a good shoulder. So that is really a, a lot of my principle, I think, you know. Knowing your ponies, um, it takes a long time. Um, but it's fascinating. I mean, you, you know, every year you think, oh, next year we'll do something better. <laughs> Which sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. I mean, one always has the odd failure. But um, one hopes to have more successes than failures as one goes on. I think it's very important to study bloodlines, uh, and uh, but also a lot of it is instinct, I think. 
Um, I mean, sometimes you can get something which you think is going to be absolutely perfect from breeding, from the breeding of the parents and the breeding of the sire, and the confirmation and everything, think, you think that this has got to be a winner, this foal, which is coming out next year. But in fact, it doesn't work. So, I don't know, I think a lot of it's good luck as well. It must be. I think people who are breeding in arable country are at a great disadvantage. I think it's a big problem for them because the land is far too rich for these ponies, which means they have to be kept in small um, paddocks and sometimes with very little food because they get so fat. And that is not really good for a pony system. I mean, a pony naturally eats all the time. Um, that's the way they survive on the moor, of course. In fact, if you put a pony which has been kept on in by land out on the moor, for the first year it, it will not thrive at all because it doesn't understand it's got to eat all the time. There were too many ponies on the moor. They were being crossed with all sorts of different breeds. And um, I think it was uh, uh, the Prince of Wales decided that something really should be done about it. So he talked to his steward, had a chat with him, and then they got on to um, another well-known farmer, John Coker, and between them they devised this, they thought up this scheme whereby, whereby um, ponies should be taken off the moor, open moor, put in these new takes with a pedigree stallion. And it's escalated like mad from there. Um, what happens now is that people put forward good Dartmoor ponies, um, people who live, they come off the moor, they're not ponies from anywhere, they must be off the moor, and um, they get inspected and branded when they're passed, and then they get put in the new takes during the summer with pedigree Dartmoor stallions. The, the, the foals the following year, the fillies, are then inspected again, mm -hmm. And if they pass, they go into the supplementary to register. And those fillies, when they're three-year-olds, get covered again by pedigree stallions, and the resulting progeny becomes pedigree. So it's a marvellous way of getting new genetic blood into the Dartmoor pony. I mean, there are areas on the moor where people are just not interested. They, they want to breed the coloured pony because in the open market, they will get more money for their coloured ponies. Uh, simply because they're bought by people who really uh, don't know what, what they're buying. I mean, you know, they're just buying them for the colour, I suppose. And the ordinary bays and browns and blacks, when they're herded up into a market, don't look very exciting, especially if they've got no papers and nobody knows what they are. But yes, I'm, I'm sure, and certainly around this area, the ponies have improved a lot. There's no doubt about it. And you, see, you see some really quite nice stallions out on the moor. Much of Elizabeth's time is now spent abroad conducting breeding seminars and lectures for the Dartmoor societies that are springing up all over the continent. There are Dartmoor pony societies now in uh, France, Germany, Holland, Sweden, uh, the USA, and there are quite a number of ponies in, in um, Australia. I don't think they've actually got a Dartmoor Pony Society there as yet. Um, and there are a few ponies in Norway, and they're becoming in increasingly enthusiastic about them. But again, they haven't actually founded a Dartmoor Pony Society. They're rather like we were in our, the embryo stage. They come under the equivalent of our National Pony Society. But um, there's tremendous demand from Germany and France, Holland, and Sweden in particular now. They're, they're more recent um, enthusiasts for the breed, and they have been um, buying a lot of ponies over here the last few years. Basically because uh, most of these countries don't have any suitable indigenous breeds themselves, and, and I think up until fairly recent years, they've been teaching their young children to ride on horses. In the blazing hot summer of 1995, Dartmoor enthusiasts from all over the world came together for a four-day international convention, the first such event that the Breed Society had ever organised. 
The finale was a day-long seminar amid the medieval splendor of Ford Abbey, a former church possession set in the most remote rural heart of Somerset. Over 150 people came to hear speakers from the four corners of the globe. It was a day for learning, for chatting, befriending rivals and making rivals of your friends. Well, of course, the remarkable thing, and it shows a great deal with this amazing, uh, also remarkable convention, I think this is just the greatest thing. I think we ought to send uh, the chairman of the Dartmoor Pony Society to the United Nations to tell them how to do it. I think they're a pony that's immediately recognisable. They've got very strong characteristics. You know, these very small, mountainy pony ears, a very broad forehead, lovely big eyes, a tremendous alert outlook, but at the same time a really kind look to them. And uh, there's no doubt that time after time, anybody looking for a pony for children, they go to the Dartmoor. I've even known a breeder of Welsh ponies, who had a lot of ponies, said to me quietly one day, I think not to be overheard, Peter, do you know somebody who's got a Dartmoor pony for sale? Uh, one that's broken to ride. And I said, uh, why? You've got 40 ponies. Yeah. She said, ah, but it's for my own nieces, uh, uh, granddaughters, and I want a Dartmoor. <laughs> what more could you say, really? <laughs> Years ago, a lady called Mrs. Harry Frank said, and I was young and impressionable, she said, if you want a really good pony, Peter, have a Dartmoor. Uh, and uh, then many years, I don't think I, I couldn't have forgotten it, because many years later I was happening to be visiting Kent, and over a hedge was the most fantastic black stallion I think I've ever seen, who actually incidentally had a wonderful name, his name was Gentle, but spelt J-E-N-T-Y-L. And he happened to be the Dartmoor stallion belonging to, uh, in those days, long since dead, uh, belonging to Pat Robinson. And it wasn't long before I bought a mare and took it to her to be covered uh, by Gentle. <laughs> and so I think that started me, yeah. It was so hot that day at Ford Abbey that even the flowers were wilting, but the audience were eager to listen to the experts that they'd come so far to hear. Superb speaker, 
And he's also a superb illustrator, of course, which helps enormously because um, in illustrating you can exaggerate and therefore make it easier for people to understand what you're trying to explain. And, and Peter is really well, world-renowned. He's traveled all over the world lecturing and so on. And um, he's also a delightfully humorous and charming person, and, and I think, and, and very professional about the whole thing, which I think is of enormous importance. Obviously, what made the pony early on was the environment in which it lived, and I think that environment bred uh, sound constitutions, a certain intelligence. You, you, you had to know where to go when the snow was coming, uh, but also it, the, it breeds a certain sort of sagacity. You, you know, you've got to want to live in a tough life, uh, uh, environment, and, uh, and I think that comes out in, in their nature very much. So they are a very sharp pony, a very intelligent pony, but at the same time they have this utter uh, common sense, um, which obviously stands them in good stead their ancestors in good stead on the moor. I mean, you had to have common sense to miss the bog or, <laughs> or live today with all the traffic. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think, I think all of those are part of the makeup of the pony. But it is important that now we breed a lot for the show that we don't forget what they originally were. They are incredibly calm, beautifully tempered ponies, and they are the only breed that I personally would trust to my own children as a first pony. Um, I can't think of any other breed that has such a temperament, good temperament. All the lessons from the experts were to be tried and tested at the annual Bicton Breed Show. As well as the usual intense competitive spirit, there was the added focus of scores of overseas visitors to acknowledge and impress. The challenge to win the treasured silverware had never been stronger. Peter Upton Number was a seven, judge. The Carew Challenge Cup for the champion there, Billy. Next, the Janus Challenge Cup for the champion standing Cold. This one. Next, the Hisley Challenge Cup for the Reserve Supreme Champion. Is he? Yes. 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 And lastly, of course, the Supremo, the Dartmouth <laughs> Challenge. Cup. Judging actually can be quite an ordeal these days. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it can certainly be an endurance test. But I can recall during the war when my sister and I used to run little shows in aid of war charities um, that we had the temerity to invite some of the best-known judges in the country to judge at these really fiddling little, very amateurish shows. And um, one of these was Henry Wynne Marlin. And um, then, to get from Berkshire, where he lived, to, De to Devon, he had to first of all start off by train. And in those days, during the war, trains didn't just take you from Paddington to Exeter or wherever. <laughs> they took you halfway around the country, and you probably had to get about three or four different trains and sit on platforms waiting endlessly. And then, having arrived at Plymouth, he had to get a bus out to our home on the edge of the moor and hump his suitcases a quarter of a mile from the bus to, the, to our home. Um, and he actually came a second time, surprisingly enough. <laughs> um, and I, I think people, they were very dedicated in those days and they certainly didn't look for any reward. Virtue, of course, is its own reward. And the Dartmoor community, whilst fiercely competitive, is in no doubt that their ponies represent much that is finest in the evolution of the native breeds. Perhaps the combination of the downright elegant with the physically tough is what makes the Dartmoor an animal that commands such fierce loyalty and total commitment from its breeders and owners. When the rosettes are awarded, everyone present knows that the winners have succeeded in one of the most demanding competitions in the pony world. Miss Roberts, Supreme Champion.
I'm coming out to present the trophy to one of the oldest breeders of double ponies. I think that's still with us. Harris Gould, a marvellous lady. So my wife and I, one of our very successful ponies, a considerable number of years ago. Also presenting Elizabeth Greenwood, presenting a special quilted rug and the overall champion. <laughs> I'm sure you ought to show your appreciation to the Supreme Champion. Come on, give them a round of applause. Supreme Champion is putting the title that deserves all the attention that it brings with it. That's better. Shilston Rocks was the venue for an arena masterclass designed to pass on a few of the secrets that bring rosettes at Bicton. On the grassy slopes around the ring, families and individuals gathered to watch an extraordinary parade of top animals. Dartmoors and others gathered together to teach the finer points of confirmation and presentation. Apart from the fact that if you're sitting on here, you're pushed around much more, you can feel the movement. It also doesn't help the horse any if it's got all the weight on, on, the, on the back and the arms here. So this part must be broad and muscular and powerful looking because this is the propelling end of the animal. And on a good mover, you will, you will immediately, particularly at a walk, instantly get that feeling that the power is coming from here and is transmitted down this powerful hind leg through the hocks and that's what moves the animal forward. I've been a member of the society and I've been breeding Dartmoor ponies and showing them and judging them in fact for longer than anybody else in the society. I, I've been showing and judging for over 50 years now and um, well, I don't know. Somebody had to be asked, and um, <laughs> uh, a well set on head and neck. You're more than halfway there. Um, if it's fine and clean in the throat, it's very much easier to get its head in the right position and to flex properly. If the shoulder is well sloping here, and the humerus is relatively vertical, the foreleg will be very far forward, and so you have all that length at ground level. The shoulder should be very flat and clean. You don't want great lumps of muscle on this part, because here again, this is the point of attachment. <laughs> I mean, obviously, like any painter, it's nice to paint something that's good looking. <laughs> and the Dartmoor just happens to be remarkably good looking as a pony. Um, in that, well, some people might even say, I suppose, like a chocolate box way, but it's not that really. But you know what I mean, it's, it is remarkably cuddly, <laughs> particularly the foals. Uh, I'm sure you have, but if you ever seen, see something like a thoroughbred foal, it's a big gangly thing. And although it's a super quality animal, you wouldn't call it attractive in the way that a, that a pony is. And it's true of all, uh, the Dartmoor pony as an adult as well. So they make just wonderful subjects. But with my own Dartmoors, who were, I suppose, more often models than anything else, um, if you put a little pile of hay down by them, they'd stand all day for you to paint them. And there's not many horses will. What I think is even the more remarkable, we've got, remember, nine native breeds in this country. and. Uh, they differ remarkably in numbers, total numbers. The Dartmoor is one of the uh, least numerous breeds, funnily enough. Uh, yet, when we have big national shows, which include interbreed championships, so the Dartmoor goes against the Welsh, the New Forest, the Connemara, whatever, it is amazing how often the Dartmoor comes out overall champion, remarkably often, which says a great deal for the pony. Um, if it can compete not only against its own breed, but against all these other native breeds and so often come out on top. We all have gone to a good bit of country and it's beautiful and quiet and we say we want to keep it that way 
so we won't tell anybody else about it. Uh, and sometimes one secretly thinks the same with the Dartmoor, but no, for the benefit of the Dartmoor, um, the more people who get to know about it and the wider its influence spreads, well, it can only be good for the Dartmoor.